and welcome to the Festival of the Muses. This live stream is presented by the Center for Hellenic Studies in collaboration with the Isadora Duncan International Institute, the Ecumenical Delphic Union, and the Committee for the Reinstatement of the Delphic Games. I'm Lana Coley, and I'm delighted to introduce the next panel, which will bring to life the songs of the ancient Greek poet Pindar. Pindar is best remembered for his victory ode celebrating the winners of athletic and artistic competitions at the Pan-Hellenic Games, such as the Pythian Games, which took place in Delphi. Today's panel features the work of writer and director Helen Eastman, composer Alex Silverman, and Professor Emerita of Classics, Nancy Felsen, along with members of the Live Canon Ensemble, actors Marin O'Hagan, Leon Scott, and Charlie Merriman. Please enjoy Performing Pindar. Performing Pindar. So before I start, I would like to thank the organizers, Lana, Zoe, Greg, and I'd like to thank Ali for her technical assistance, and also the mayor of Delphi, Kalt, Mayor Kaltzis, and Jean Bresciani of the Isidore Duncan Foundation or Institute. Um, I also especially want to thank my friend and colleague, Laura Slatkin, for connecting me to Lana and getting this whole project underway. I really appreciate that, Laura. Thank you. Now I'll begin. So I want to start by talking about Pindar of Thebes, who lived from 518 to 438 BCE, approximately, and wrote poems in a number of genres. Uh, preserved on 17 papyrus rolls, with only a fourth of his poetry surviving. He wrote hymns and laments and maiden songs and victory odes, which is our focus today. The best preserved of his corpus are his 45 complete victory odes or eponitians, epinikia upon a victory. So the victor's family would commission an eponition poet to compose and train a chorus to perform a victory ode, usually in the victor's hometown. And the ode would celebrate the equestrian or combat, combat sport or foot race, foot race victory at one of the four Pan-Hellenic religious festivals at Olympia, at Delphi, at Nemea, or on the Isthmus. Simonides and then Pindar and Bacchylides would celebrate athletic stars from all over the Greek world. Pindar's odes, for example, praise victors from Sicily and southern Italy to Cyrene in North Africa to Aegina, Athens, Thebes on the mainland. Pindar's eponitions have heterogeneous uh, co components ingeniously intertwined to make a case for elevating the victor to a, his, uh, to a hero's status. In addition to eponition features such as praise of the victor, his relatives, his homeland, its topography and local legends, the longer odes contain elaborate myths that resonate subtly but significantly with the victor's praise and often with the poet's composition story. That is his story of how I made this ode. The value of arete excellence permeates the corpus in a number of semantic domains. Another standard feature is the maxim, which universalizes the victory and signals connections among the ode's components. And the coherence of a given ode contributes to its appeal and to its longevity across time and space. largely by making sense of the victory as something of a heroic achievement. The project that we're, we embarked on was to see what we could learn from staging Pindar's Pythian Nine. The ode celebrates a young athlete, Telesicrates, for his victory in a hoplite race held at Delphi in 474. Helen and I selected it for its dramatic lengthy abduction and colonization myth, which occupies 65 of 126 lines. In the mythic section, the young Apollo elicits his mentor's approval 
to lay his famed hand on the maiden Cyrene and pluck the sweet grass from her bed. He wants to do this on the spot. Chiron counsels Apollo to, to slow down and to use persuasion, not force. The narrator nevertheless uses a verb meaning to grab or snatch, harpaz, to describe Apollo's abduction of the maiden to North Africa. One interpretive question that I've been tackling is whether Chiron, the civilized centaur, is a restraining or an enabling force for the impetuous god. Helen and I knew from the beginning that we wanted to explore themes of gender dynamics in Pindar through performance and a close, close reading of the text. With the sustained support of Fiona McIntosh, director of the archives of performances of Greek and Roman drama, we gathered in January 2019 in Oxford, UK for a four day workshop that included a series of miniature performances that Helen and Alex and the six actors and I helping in the background designed and enacted. My culminating lecture just before the performance was on Pythian 9 and it was entitled what would Cyrene say? Strategies of silence and elision in Pindar's Ninth Pythian Ode. It explored whether the myth offers a template for the behavior of a youth on the verge of manhood or perhaps a critique. I also made some connections to Donald Trump's behavior toward women and to the Kavanaugh trials. So my research questions at the beginning uh, I'll just mention five of them. They, they kind of have grown in depth since we started our experiment. One was how the actors might convey the first person singular voice, ego, when he was pretending to compose on the spot, something uh, some Pindaric scholars call pseudo spontaneity. A second was, would the myth be the most dramatically engaging component? Would the factual elements about the victor be of interest? Would the facts about the composition of the poem capture the audience's attention? A third was how would the diverse components of the ode come across in performance? And would the connections, the interconnections be detected? And then number four was how, would, how might Chiron's advice land on Apollo's ear. And today I add, since it's since we're in the midst of Black Lives Matter and it's the it is Juneteenth Day celebrating the end of slavery, how would having and not having voice resonate with some of our modern challenges and difficulties? Uh, would this poem speak to those concerns. I hope to return to that at the end of our, uh, our presentations. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. Um, my name is Helen Eastman. I'm a classicist and also a director of theatre and um, a writer. And I'm also the director of the Live Canon Ensemble. I um, had the extraordinary privilege on working on this project with Nancy, which came about almost by accident. We were both um, visiting uh, the University of British Columbia at the same time and uh, ended up having dinner together as we were the two guest academics at the time. And um, uh, she told me about her extensive work on Pindar and I asked whether a performative approach had ever been taken to that work. And uh, thus this project was born. Um, I believe in performance practice as a way of approaching uh, academic texts. That's not just because I've had the privilege of a career which straddles academia and performance, but I believe that we learn the most about performance texts when we perform them. And I think a good analogy for that would be everything we've learned about Shakespeare through the performance of it, or everything we have learned about uh, Greek drama or ancient tragedy through and comedy through the performance of them. Um, I'm not particularly interested in reconstruction, and uh, but in what we learn by applying contemporary performance techniques to ancient texts. When we look at the incredible breadth of performances of Greek drama over the last 30 years, it strikes me as um, quite incredible that so little has been done performatively 
with Pinder. I, like many other classicists, uh, was certainly brought up to believe in my undergraduate days that Pindar was very hard and slightly unapproachable uh, in terms of the text, that it was difficult Greek. Uh, and uh, like many undergraduates, uh, I managed to avoid and swerve it. So my relationship with Pindar has come really in the last uh, few years. And um, I've started to think much more about those texts and what they might have actually been like in performance. There are lots of unanswered questions. Um, and that was what we set out to do in this project. I was working with Alex Silverman. Uh, he and I have collaborated quite extensively on the performance of ancient Greek texts. We're both complete meter geeks and nerds uh, and spend uh, a lot of time thinking about what those rhythms uh, of the ancient texts give to us now as uh, theater makers and as musicians. Um, and we had worked over a long period of time together over a decade as the guest director and composer of the Cambridge Greek play uh, on five different uh, plays in the ancient language. And I've also worked extensively with Maureen O'Hagan, who is also in this uh, Zoom room as the directors of Bareface Greek Film Company, which has made a series of films which look contemporary but are in the original Greek with subtitles. So I've spent quite a lot of the last, last decade working with Greek texts in performance, sometimes with professional actors, sometimes with classicists, sometimes with academics, and sometimes with community choruses. And I'm also really interested in seeing what very diverse groups of people bring to these texts. Um, when we did this project at Oxford, we brought together a mixed chorus of some actors who had no Greek whatsoever, some classicists, some graduate students, and everybody brought something very different into that space. Over the next um, hour and a half, we're going to show you some of what we found and some of what we explored. Some of the performance is going to be live and some of it's going to be played in on video clips from our previous R&D because the one thing about a Zoom call is that you can't do anything that involves more than one person in any kind of physical proximity to anybody else. So some of the things that are best demonstrated in space with corporeal bodies in space interacting have to be played in as video clips from our last R&D and some of the things that we can make work as solo performances can happen in this way. Um, we are spread all over the UK if you're um, uh, trying to place my accent. I'm here in London, uh, Alex our composer is in Oxfordshire and the three actors are scattered around the place. Fingers crossed that our broadband is going to uh, hold up, that none of our children are gonna run into the room during this presentation, but if they do, we'll give them big hugs and let them join in with some Greek. Um, and uh, a massive thank you to our hosts for making this possible to come together with such camaraderie uh, in such strange times. So, um, when we came to approach this project, we had said we're going to spend a week exploring Pindar from a performative perspective. Now, in some ways, that is nonsense, and we realized that pretty much instantaneously, because what is a performative perspective? Um, it could take into account any one of an infinite number of performance practices. So we've had the privilege when we look at perhaps uh, performances of Greek tragedy of having seen them performed in a myriad of theatrical traditions, be that naturalist, realist, Lecoq, Brecht, a no theater approach to Greek tragedy or performances uh, in dance. Um, and so we had to ask ourselves on day one, what are we actually going to do with this text? Are we going to dance it, sing it, shout it from the rooftops? Is it going to be choral? Is it going to be individual? Um, and we went for something of a scattergun approach. Um, one might say that might be unsatisfying. What we actually did was the moment we tried something, we thought we were finding something useful and we were learning something we moved on to the next thing. Because in some ways, what we achieved in that week was to lift the lid on a whole variety of performance practices that might be interesting to apply it to Pindar. In some ways, that's an invitation to a wider community to get out there and investigate these texts in that way. So we barely touched the surface, for example, of dance. Uh, we didn't get particularly far in working with choral music. So at the end of this, I hope we'll have a little bit of discussion of all the things that might go forth from this, but I hope you'll be convinced that taking a performative approach to Pindar is definitely worth it. Um, we had to start at the beginning with the text, as we always do, and with the meter. So I'm gonna hand over to Alex Silverman, our composer, who's going to tell you a little bit about how we approach that. Uh, great, thank you, Helen, um, and it's uh, thank you very much for having us today. It's lovely to join you wherever you are uh, looking at Pindar with us. Uh, so my name's Alex. I'm a composer. I'm a musician and a recovering classicist. Uh, it's a problem I haven't quite shaken off. Um, 
largely due to overexposure to Helen Eastman, but we've collaborated on a lot of projects like this. And um, this is my first time with uh, Pindar, um, but it was it's a really interesting one. Um, being a recovering classicist is, I think, the least interesting thing that I can bring to a room uh, in this sort of investigation, because my job is I'm a, I write music for the stage, so I work with directors, actors, musicians, and I find ways of lifting words off the page and that seems a, a sort of really concise way of describing what our what our game was in that week um so sometimes i do that with a, an orchestra or maybe some unaccompanied voices or a group of specialized period musicians or it's just a group of actors playing drums in the rain but it's a wide uh the toolkit is very broad and the starting point is always the same here is here is a text uh how can we uh, do something with this, um, which is to say, um, we come at this with a very open mind, and our early questions that are important to us include sort of scale. We're thinking about how big a performance is this, what, how big a performance could one eke from this text, uh, what is the context, who are the audience, um, but we're always really, really focused on the story. Um, to reiterate one thing that Helen said, we're never reconstructing. Um, lots of people are very engaged in that as a pursuit. Uh, I think it's completely valid and very fascinating and it's not what we do and it's not what we set out to do in the workshop. Um, we're not really even looking for the authentic or the ancient, but we are formulating a creative response as a, as a sort of first impulse. Uh, it takes the text as a starting point and, and bears in mind the need of, to communicate it with someone else uh, there's always a third party in the room is us and there's pindar and there's also someone that we're talking to and that's quite important um that's all very vague specifics in terms of how a musician approaches a text like this before i'll i'll go on to talk about rhythm uh in a second um so when you're thinking about a musical response to a poem like this i want raw content uh, so what has pindar given us to work with uh, to make music I need rhythm and we, like I say we'll go into that pitch is also will be quite handy to make music uh, and that is infinitely as uh, intricately wound to uh, who is in the room what voices are there what is the instrumentation um, and Nancy already touched on in her overview on on some of the people that are in there with us that that are leaping off off the page so there's a declamatory voice there's an ego uh, we'll talk about that in a second uh, there's the characters you've got apollo and chiron and and, and a silent sirene um, we have to think in terms of orchestration instrumentation about what other support this poem might need to hold your attention uh, to make it audible uh, depending what space you're in that's a really important factor how do you grab someone's ear to start with, how do you hold their attention, um, and how do you make it vivid, obviously. So we're, we didn't work with uh, instrumentalists in this week particularly, um, but it is, they're always on the page. It's worth thinking about what else, what else could feed into this uh, performance. Um, dynamics and tempo, uh, I'm looking for those in the text. Uh, is it, do, is, are there things there that tell me whether things should be loud or soft or fast or slow? Um, we'll look at those in a little bit. Um, and the structure, there's clues in the structure, the pattern of, of the verses. This uh, ode has a very a recognisable uh, antistrophe, epode, uh, sorry, strophe, antistrophe, epode, repeat, uh, A, A, B structure, essentially. Um, so there's lots of questions that, that flow from that uh, musically. Do we need to do that? Uh, do we need to repeat things over like a hymn or can we mix it up and play with the resonance between verses in, in different ways? Um, so those are things that I'm looking for sort of in a text as a response to this. Um, the first of Nancy's questions, uh, research questions that you posed there um, is a really fascinating one. It's one on which a lot of ink has been spilt, and that's the question of ego. There's, is, are these written for one person to perform as if extemporizing? Are they written to be performed by a chorus? Um, uh, so much of Pindar scholarship is devoted to arguments about how many people delivered these oaths, and we are in a room with more than one person, which seems a very good way to, to start looking at that question. Uh, it's amazing how much has been said uh, has been written about what is said about performance in the poems themselves and in the scholia uh, and other places, but uh, how very little exploration has been done 
to what happens when you try and perform a victory ode and what that could tell us uh, about it. Um, that makes this a very positive uh, experience, I think, that we've got something to say there. Um, there's also barely any modern performance uh, culture of Pindar, notwithstanding uh, tomorrow's Pythianate extravaganza, which I will obviously write the rules uh, for another generation. Um, but that means there are no rules well, there for us, really, when we play. Uh, what we have, as Helen listed, are some talented people and about enough snacks to keep us going for a week. So that's a time frame and we we have a go. Um, so it means we can try, for instance, with the ego chorus question, uh, three interpretations of the opening lines with one person, and then we can try another three with the same lines, but using a chorus. Now, this won't be exhaustive or definitive, but even in that sort of rough, simple exercise that I've outlined, you're going to hear things that you can't access by just looking in the books, and that's really important. Some of the things will be totally irrelevant. Some of them will stimulate questions about the source material. Uh, some of the results might be attractive, but uh, and it's clear that if you want to pin down exactly how it was first performed, and some people do, then you need to hear how it sounds and how it feels with one or three or 40 performers. And then you take that in conjunction with the clues in the text. Um, and really importantly, because it's a performance piece, you have to consider the space and the audience. And now we're working in a small room with just a few people, but we could. And I think it would be interesting going forward, uh, work further and model bigger or smaller performances with more or fewer people uh, really effectively. And that would be interesting. We could learn more about the experience of playing and receiving this material uh, by doing this sort of work. Um, we won't settle a debate for forever, uh, but it will be it really would be interesting to share that work with people who are who have been looking at the textual and the archaeological angles also. Helen, I think you want to come in on that. Um, we for anyone who is uh, no, doesn't know Greek, uh, who is listening in, um, when we talk about the ego question, what we're talking about is is the word for I in Greek is ego. And um, the speaker in Pindar's poems uh, uses the first person singular, so, so says ego about themselves. And so the debate is, given that the person speaks in the first person singular, saying I, I sing or I believe, um, uh, could it have been performed by uh, a chorus rather than a single person? Now, there are plenty of examples where um, ego is used um, first person singular in I'm uncertain whether everybody is frozen or just Helen. I think it's just Helen. Let's just see. Helen. I, I could add here while she's getting set up that. Please no, um, I'm back there. Have you moved on? Oh, good. No, go um, ahead. Well, I was explaining Ego. I'm so sorry. Uh, dodgy broadband here in a raining storm in South London. Um, uh, hopefully the rain will stop and it will improve. Um, uh, I was just explaining that we use the first person, uh, the speaker, in the Pindar poems. but uh, And so thus the debate has, has raged as to whether it was performed by a single person or a chorus. Um, Greek drama gives us the precedent for, for the use of Ego for a whole chorus speaking. Um, and contemporary performance practice also shows us that that is completely possible and plausible. There are lots of examples of um, ensembles or choruses in contemporary versions of plays who use I uh, to speak as an ensemble. An example would be uh, Seamus Heaney's The Curate Troy. But um, uh, what we therefore did in the course of the week is to, to mix working with choruses and working with individual speakers. And you're going to see a bit of both in this uh, presentation, which will allow you to formulate some of your own ideas on on uh, whether um, how it feels as an audience member to hear that text delivered by one person or to hear it delivered by a community uh, of people. I'm going to pass back to uh, Alex, who's going to continue on into uh, the rhythm. Okay, uh, so um, as I said, top of my sort of musical shopping list. Uh, formulating a response to a piece like this is uh, is the meter, is rhythm, is rhythmical content. I find that very exciting. Um, if you're not very excited by Greek lyric meter, this could be a dark 
five minutes or so, but stay with me because it's fun. Uh, it's awesome. Um, now, a classicist is going to tell you that the meter we're dealing with here with here is uh, dactyloepitrite. Um, that's true. It's a pretty name for uh, an intriguing form, uh, and the words dactyloepitrite are not in any way helpful to any performer who wants to get a sense of how to perform, uh, which is the sort of st where we found ourselves on the Monday morning in Oxford. Um, I want to get close to what the rhythm is that drives the stories here, um, because it's integral to the how Pindar chose to put those words in, in that order. Um, we don't have to make things that capture or replicate that rhythm, although we will try. Um, but I insist that we do acknowledge it, because if we don't, then we're missing out on um, on a big part of the picture. Um, it is true to say that from a performance perspective, meter can be uh, a, a barrier to accessing these texts, um, especially when the meter is complex or it's varied, which it is across Greek lyric. Um, bluntly, in a practical way, it takes longer for performers to feel comfortable saying words when, when they come uh, in uh, combinations and rhythmic combinations that are unfamiliar to modern uh, tongues. Um, so we approach this using a form of substitution. That's the word I'm going to give it, which uh, allows us to move pretty quickly from nothing uh, to a point where a group of people who may or may not have uh, Greek uh, in their pocket um, can play with a text uh, and and essentially undertake a whole verse at a time. Um, now the caveat, very important, big capital letters caveat here. Um, any apologies to any serious distinguished uh, metricians who are watching on YouTube right now. I hope that's what they're doing with their Friday mornings. Uh, I am a humble musician. This may contain inaccuracies. Uh, please address any complaints to um, Professor Nancy Felsen, Department of Classics, University of Georgia, um, or nudge Lana with questions uh, as we go, and then I will look forward to learning more about meter as we go. Anyway, um, substitution is where a process of where we take a scary looking metrical analysis um, of a of a text and we in place of the we look we identify shapes and we substitute out the words of Pindar's poem for words that flow more easily for us uh, as speakers. Um, I'm going to attempt uh, screen sharing now. Um, stand by everybody. This is my first ever uh, public screen sharing. I think I've closed everything that you shouldn't see. Um, bear with. It's going jolly well so far. Uh, da, 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 da. Hang on, hang on, hang on. It's almost like a practice. This. Oh, that one there. Uh, that one there. Oh no, that one there. That's good. And you should be able to see. Can you see a whiteboard? Yes. You can. Thank you, Helen. Very good. So uh, this is a slightly intimidating looking picture, but this is the only tool I need to get uh, a room of people um, chanting complete nonsense, but in a very authentic uh, meter. Uh, I'm going to just scroll down to a slightly cleaner version of that, I think. Oh, there we are. Um, this is a more traditional uh, metrical analysis of a strophe from Pythia 9. Uh, to clarify what looks like a V is a short syllable, uh, what I would call a quaver, and over in on the other side of the Atlantic, I believe you call an eighth uh, note, and underneath that a dash, that's a longer syllable, which is about twice the length of a short syllable. Uh, forgive me if you know this already, so I call that a crotchet, charmingly, uh, and I believe you call it a quarter. Um, and that is... A transcription of the rhythm of the strophe or antistrophe of this poem, more or less, uh, and it's as a document, it's it's fine. We can work with that, but it's quite difficult to read. You have to concentrate very hard on it. You can only really read one beat at a time um, because it ch and it changes so frequently. It's very difficult to get a sense of the overall structure. So what we're going to do is we're going to start s looking for big blocks in there and substituting them out for things that are easier to work with. Um, here is another slide I think you can see. Uh, the biggest building blocks in here, which uh, 
Mars calls the big D, or uh, you will recognize if you know your meters as a dactylic component. Um, now, the, I've highlighted these in pink, so largely they look like this. If you can see my cursor, Lana, I can see you. Can you see my cursor? You can, great. So, so I'm gonna, this is, this is essentially long, short, short, long, short, short, long, long, and I think that goes cake and a nice cup of coffee. Uh, which is pretty easy. You can try that at home if you're if you're muted or if you're following on YouTube. Try it now. Just say it. Cake and a nice cup of coffee. Okay, that's good. That sort of worked. Um, and you can see there are eight of those in here, uh, scattered through the verse. And there's also two slightly naughty short ones, uh, which have a a long beat missing on the end. And they go cake and a nice cup of tea. Um, but even that has essentially dealt with most of the verse form there. So from halfway through line six all the way to the middle of line nine, we've got a whole run of these that I can tell you now goes like this. It goes cake and a nice cup of tea, cake and a nice cup of coffee, cake and a nice cup of coffee, cake and a nice cup of coffee, cake and a nice cup of tea. So that was just one substitution that's allowed us to do uh, a pretty big chunk. I'm going to move on because you don't want to talk about this for the whole hour and a half. Um, but the next step uh, answers another of Nancy's questions, which we have the other large component in here is what we call a, a cretic or it's little c in some analyses, uh, which goes, uh, uh, it's dun, 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 I've made a mistake here, but it goes <laughs> long, short, long, uh, long, short, long. As you see, I've, I've written that backwards up here, which is very unhelpful. Anyway, c crate. Um, and there's lots of those and they seem to uh, there's eight of those in total uh, and the other thing that happens is we have single long syllables which join everything together and we decided to substitute those for something very easy to say which is hey um, and by the time we've taken out all the secretaries and all the cakes and a nice cup of coffees uh, we've got a good chunk of the verse covered. Now I'm going to talk about the secrete. Nancy asked the question, is there any, is there evidence of any resonance of the victor's uh, person, of his name, uh, throughout the poem? He's uh, name checked right in line three of the poem, um, but are there other distinguishing marks that come out in performance as being resonant of of the person to whom this poem is dedicated. And my answer to that is, yeah, I think so. I think the rhythm of his name, Telesicrete, Telesicretes, uh, it's all scattered through this uh, ode. It's all the way there. It's in almost every line. There's lots of occurrences of it, uh, and we can hear it a lot. Uh, I'm going to move on to the next couple of substitutions so that you can start to hear uh, more of how this poem sounds and also some other people's voices. Uh, so completing the picture, notwithstanding my mistake in line two. Um, the, where have we got to? Uh, so we fill in the gaps. Uh, as I said, Telesicrates is sort of name checked in line three. Telesicra, uh, I'm pointing at my screen and you can't see that. Telesicra. That makes more sense. And a very similar rhythm to that appears in line one. Tell us, Ikra. And the only other two gaps that we have to fill are right at the bottom where we uh, we find this other extra little component, uh, which goes long, short, short, long, which I would describe as more coffee, please. Um, now, I've been through that slightly too fast, um, but the, re the point I'm trying to make is what we've done is we've broken down a sea of longs and shorts. It looks like it's just a it's syllable soup. Um, and we have found in it recurring shapes, made very simple substitutions into English or phrases that we are able to say as a group together. Um, and what that does is turn our initial picture uh, into something uh, quite performable. Uh, excuse me, I'll just click on here. And which is this. Um, and it takes really not very long to take to train a small group of people who don't know any Greek how to relatively accurately perform uh, the rhythm of this verse. And I think we've got a clip of that. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen if I can find the right button, uh, which is over here and ask Leon if he can load up clip one. There it is. Amazing. 
So, it will sound like this is going to take you away. Yeah, yeah, good luck, people. Well, that was going so well. So, it will sound like. We can hear it. You can hear it? Yep. Excellent. I can't. So, it will sound like this is going to take you away. Yeah. Yeah, good luck, people. Della Cicla, hey! And a nice cup of coffee. Secret, hey! Secret, hey! Della Cicla, hey! And a nice cup of coffee. Hey! And a nice cup of coffee. Hey! And a nice cup of coffee. Secret, hey! playing that Leon. Um, so we um, uh, thank you to everyone who was in that video which is some of the performers who are here today and some amazing grad students at the University of Oxford who came to join the um, the uh, exploration and were very brave because we checked them straight in the deep end and that was um, our attempt to get a group of people who didn't know anything about the meter of this text uh, found it a little bit impenetrable and frightening to be able to perform the meter within about half an hour. Um, which Alex and I have found is a really important step to tackling these texts uh, in performance. Because if you have a company of actors and you've got six weeks to rehearse um, a, an ode, a play, anything in ancient Greek, what you can't do is wait to do any rehearsal until the point where everyone can say every single line. Because uh, that's not gonna happen until about week four or five. And actually you've got to find all kinds of rehearsal methods for people to start to feel the rhythms, the meters, the sounds and the shapes of these texts. And so substitution can be amazing uh, for that. Um, what we then did was we started to play with the different ways we could perform that material because there's quite a dominating rhythm there. But our question is, what does that translate to in performance? Does it mean that the text has to sound a particular way or do you still have a really wide range of options of what you can then do with that meter? So in a minute, we're going to watch um, three clips and I'll say a few words before each of them where we take that metrical block, all those cakes and cups of coffee, and we perform it in completely different styles to see whether we can hold on to that core metrical element but completely change the performance convention. Um, the first one we're going to have a look at is uh, performing it in the style of a rather rowdy football or soccer crowd um, uh, playing on the idea of what a victory ode might sound like. Does it sound like a rabble rousing chorus celebrating their team having won the cup? So could you play the second clip for us, Leon? Thank you. Let's go around twice, just for the <coughs> <point. laughs> Jealousy, man, hey, 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 take that rhythm we can take it in quite a violent quite aggressive quite celebratory way and in the next clip we're going to do something completely um different with it two things to say just before we move on one 
I'm sure by now that you can hear the name of the victor resonating through that in the rhythm. So Nancy's point about whether even though the victor is only mentioned once, we feel their presence. We can metrically feel that name, can't we, Telesecretaire, just running and running and running through, and I'm sure you can all hear that by now. Um, also, apologies for any... Um, lack of quality in these clips. They are an archival video from our R&D in Oxford, which we weren't expecting to ever share with the general public. But the fact that we can't actually all be in the same place at the moment means that we are reliant on our slightly dodgy archival recording uh, to share this with you. So thanks for bearing with us. So the next clip is exactly the same metrical material, just dealt with stylistically very differently. Off we go. Tell the secret cake and a nice cup of coffee. Secret egg, hey, secret egg, hey, hey. Tell the secret cake and a nice cup of coffee. Cake and a nice cup of coffee. Cake and a nice cup of coffee. Secret egg, hey, cake and a nice cup of coffee. Secret egg. Thank you, Leon. Uh, so what we've quite crudely demonstrated there is that in honouring the metrical material, that doesn't necessarily um, uh, tell us exactly how something tonally must have been performed. And within the same metrical material, there might be quite a range of tones and shapes. One of the questions we have about these lyric poems is because they have the same metre, does that mean they sound the same all the way through? And I think that shows us that actually they could have masses of tonal variation in them, even with the same metre. Sometimes we enjoy between one uh, strophe and the next, which might imply that there is a sustained tone from one to the next. But what we are really looking at is when we uh, look at a particular um, particular sound or a particular meter, what is the absolute sort of maximum range that might be possible performatively to get out of that? Um, before we look, at, I think Alex is just going to introduce the third of those clips before we carry on. Hello. So the last of these clips uh, is more complex. Uh, continuing in the same direction, we've been adding more musical interest. So you heard some uh, uh, extemporized uh, piano accompaniment to that last one. Um, this next clip involves uh, more singing, so we're using the voices of the chorus to support uh, Charlie uh, as a soloist pronouncing uh, this rhythm. And the just a word on that material, which is that uh, the music is still absolutely tied to and derived from the metrical shapes. So essentially the chorus for, for a cake and coffee block sing one set of notes, um, whereas they sing a different set of notes for secrete. So we're using the music to bring out actually uh, the form. So the, for uh, the form and the content absolutely hand in glove. And it's, it's an exercise in, in seeing what music we can derive because it is that shape. Um, and so lots of birds being killed with, with multiple stones. It also makes a good old noise, uh, which gives us an idea of what it is to, to put lots and lots of voices into this sort of verse form. Um, I believe there's a false start on the video um, where, and let's assume that was my fault. <laughs> Um, I, I yes, there's, I, I took the full start off, but the, the video does start with Alex apologising for what went before. Um, just to say, in this clip, we've popped the original Greek back in. Oh, so yeah. what we've done in this clip is uh, we've substituted the Greek back in for the cakes and the cups of coffee. So that being the next stage of the progression, once we've got really comfortable with the rhythm to actually put words back in. Will you go for it, Leon? Good. That didn't happen. <laughs>
well done, Charlie. <laughs> Charlie's in the Zoom room. Thumbs up to him. Um, uh, thank you. So um, for those of you who've waited, you know, 45 minutes for your first uh, hearing of a bit of Greek, sorry for making you wait so long. Um, moving on from there, we then wanted to look at lots more performance styles, and we decided that we could probably think about working in translation as well, which has always been a valid approach to working on all ancient texts. Um, but what we couldn't really find was performance translation of Pindar. Um, and uh, as anyone who's ever tried to put on a production of a Greek tragedy will know, there's a massive difference between a, a translation that works really well on the page as a literal translation to help you crib your way through a text um, and uh, one that is actually speakable by uh, in actor's mouths. And there isn't really a, any kind of history of performance translation of Pindar. So there are very few translations that are designed for performance. There's a few, but there's not much of a tradition there. And um, we are very lucky. Um, what Life Canon does, we're a performance, uh, a poetry performance organization, and we and we perform and publish and celebrate poetry in lots of different ways. Uh, but we do have a network of contemporary poets we work with, and we were able to reach out to them and ask them if any of them were interested in the idea of translating Pindar for performance. Um, we actually work with six different poets who all produce uh, performance translations of different bits of Pythian 9. I'm gutted that we can't share them all within the context of this session because it isn't long enough. Um, but we were able to gather those texts and look at them all and then explore them all in different performance um, traditions that seem to spring from the way that they had translated them. So as an example of that practice, what we're going to do is we're going to look at a translation that was by um, the poet Leslie Saunders, who is a phenomenal poet, please check out and explore her work. Um, and uh, we um, felt that her particular translation lent to a very um, joyful, witty rendering of her text. Um, I'm going to ask Maureen to just read um, a, a little excerpt from the translation so you get a flavour for what it sounds like if uh, Maureen's happy to do that. Thank you. And he, Hypsius, brought up his daughter Kyrene with those gorgeous arms of hers, who wasn't in love with her loom, all that pacing up and down in a tiny room, who didn't do ladies who lunch, but who could wield a powerful spear and hunting knife and rode out to slaughter the wild creatures so her father's herds of cattle could graze in peace and quiet. The only one who shared her bed was sleep. And that was short and sweet. She wasted little time on him, letting him lean on her eyelids for as long as dawn broke. Thank you, Maureen. Um, uh, Leslie is, like many of us, a recovering classicist, so was able to work from the original um, Greek. Um, and her sparkly and, and playful translation led us to work in a slightly um, uh, physical theatre, playful, storytelling, uh, naughty kind of a way. Um, and uh, this is the performance that sprung off this particular translation. Thanks, Leah. And he, Hypsis, brought up his daughter Cyrene with those gorgeous arms of hers. <laughs> but she was not in love with her loom. All that pacing back and forth in a tiny room. She didn't do ladies who lunch. But she could wield a powerful spear. He shouted his 
question to Chiron, the wisest of all centaurs. Son of Philera, come out of your cave and take a look at the spirit and strength of this woman. Isn't she amazing? She's a total fearless fighter. Nothing can scare the shit out of her. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, in the course of a week, we romped through quite a lot of different ways uh, of working and thinking about what performance styles might be interesting ways to interrogate this work. Um, uh, now you'll see that uh, uh, Professor um, Felsen was actually featuring in uh, this workshop, and I thought it was a good moment to just pause and ask her, as a Pindar scholar who's been working on these texts for a very long time, what the actual experience of being within that workshop was. Well, it was, I was terrified, as maybe you can see on the screen. It felt like there was some cognitive dissonance from um, being a scholar or being a reader of the text to actually being inside the story. So it was like crossing into a fictional world. And in retrospect, I liked being on Cyrene's team because I think that there is a Cyrene story that takes one turn after Apollo abducts her to North Africa, but that had its own shape before that. And um, that was a moment in that clip where you couldn't see exactly till the end uh, where all this good energy and heroism of Cyrene, who's like a, Heracl a female Heracles, where all that would go. So I, I, I learned a lot from it. Thank you, Nancy, for being so game. Um, and so we then went in a direction of wanting to explore sort of two things through one set of exercises, which um, is coming up, which was firstly this question of the voiceless in the text. So we um, we spent quite a lot of time thinking about the absence of um, Cyrene in the text and the female voice in the text, and we'll come back to that a bit more in a minute. And we also started to think about the embodiment of these characters within the text and what happens when you... Um, uh, look not only at the characters who are speaking, but the characters who are receiving that uh, that speech within the text. So who are the silent listening characters within the narrative? Um, and what happens when you literally embody a text and you, you, you get willing and brilliant uh, actors to be a corporeal presence within the text? So um, next we're going to look at uh, the same... Um, uh, piece of the text, this time translated by Peter Singer. If you are uh, listening in, thank you very much for your translation, which is brilliant and so helpful to this exercise. Um, that we have um, the same bit of text, which is essentially a speech, a monologue, um, delivered three ways. The first time as a monologue straight out to the audience, no fourth wall, direct address to the audience. The second time we place the person who is listening to the speech, so we place a second man in the scene who is receiving it, and we allow some focus to be both on the speaker and on the receiver of that speech. And on the third time, we place the uh, a physical embodiment of the absent woman in the text who is completely voiceless, but we have an object on stage, uh, an objectified woman who we are talking about and how that changes the experience both of listening to this text and viewing the text as an audience. So you're going to see the same scene three times. The first time it's done by one person, second time by two, the third time by three. And really the focus here is to think about how that is different for the listener and the viewer. Thanks very much, Leon. The great centaur chuckled wrinkled his brow, softly returned back his thought. Secret, the Akita loves in a sanctum. Phoebus, a secret of thought and persuasion. And that's the same gods as for mortals, the shy, holding back the restraint from open snatching of pleasure. Even you then, though you cannot rightly be touched by untruth, still 
It was a subtle urge, wasn't it, that swayed you to utter those words, to ask of the girl, of her family. You, Lord, you know every outcome, each way to it. See the number of spring shoots the earth spawned, the number of sands struck by waves and by wind in sea and in river. See what will be and from where it will come. All that. If I must pit myself against wisdom, though, I say this. As husband you came to this grove, and you will, by the far sea, sweep her off to the very finest garden of Zeus. There, make her head of a city you found from an island people drawn to that hill. And see then, wide glade lady Libya, take the glorious creature in her gold house, graciously gift for her own a portion of all fruit-rich land, land blessed with beasts, too. There, she will bear a child. And Lord Hermes will take him from his own mother's grasp to show to the goddesses earth and the seasons in their high seat. They'll wonder at him. The small child on their lap will touch with nectar and ambrosia his lips. They'll make him immortal. Secret, their keys to love's inner sanctum, a secret of thought and <coughs> persuasion. And it's the same for gods as for mortals, the shy holding back the restraint from open snatching of pleasure. Even you then, though you cannot rightly be touched by untruth, still, it was a subtle urge, wasn't it? that swayed you to ask of the girl, of her family, you, Lord, who know every outcome, each way to it, see the number of spring shoots the earth spawned, the number of sand struck by waves and by wind in sea and in river, see what will be and from where it will come, all that. If I must, pit myself against wisdom, though. I say this, as husband you came to this grove, and you will, by the far sea, sweep her off to the very finest garden of Zeus. There, make her head of a city you found from an island people drawn to that hill. And see then the wide glade lady Libya, Take the glorious creature in her gold house, graciously gift for her own, a portion of all fruit-rich land, land blessed with beasts too. There, she will bear a child, and Lord Hermes will take him from his own mother's grasp and to show him to the goddesses earth and the seasons in their high seat, they wonder at him. The small child on their lap will touch with nectar and ambrosia his lips. They'll make him immortal. The secret, the keys to love's inner sanctum, secret of thought and persuasion. And it's the same for the gods as it is for mortals. The shy. The shy holding back 
the restraint, um, open snatching of pleasure. Even you, then, though you cannot rightly be touched by untruth, still, it was a subtle urge, wasn't it? It swayed you to utter those words, to ask of the girl, of the family, you, Lord, who know every outcome, each way to it. See the number of spring shoots the earth spawned, the number of sand struck by waves and by wind in sea and in river. See what will be and from where it will come. All that if I must pit myself against wisdom, I say this. As husband, you came to this world, and you will, by the far sea, sweep her off to the very finest garden of Zeus. There make her head of a city you found from an island people drawn to that hill. And then see the wide glade lady Libya take the glorious creature in her gold house, graciously gift for her own a portion of all fruit rich land, land blessed with beasts too. There she will bear a child. And Lord Hermes will take him from his own mother's glass, clasp to show to the goddesses, earth and the seasons in their high seat. They'll wonder at him, this small child on their lap will touch with nectar and ambrosia his lips. They'll make him immortal. Um, I, Nancy, I know that, um, uh, thank you, obviously, to Maureen and to Leon and to Charlie, um, and I don't think um, I need to state the obvious about uh, the, the sexual politics or dynamic in that particular section of, of the text, but, um, but the embodiment of it felt quite helpful to us as an ensemble, and I thought I'd pass over to Nancy to, to get her reflections on that. Uh, just briefly, I had a lot of, uh, it had a lot of resonance with me, particularly the theme of the collusion of Apollo and Chiron that came out in the second rendering and particularly in the third. Uh, Cyrene, whether she was able to hear or not, which in the text, there's no indication that she knows she's being watched, but whether, whether or not she was aware of her future destiny that was being determined by these two guys, uh, you could see it happening. You could see her story morphing into one in which even the product of her womb wasn't her own. And I thought that the that um, Leon and Charlie kind of brought that out in the third rendering because by essentially you could see them treating her as if she was a statue or an object and as if her womb, the product, Aristias, was going to be taken away from her just as she was taken away from her native land. So I, it was powerful to me and um, spoke to some of the issues I'm very interested in. Um, in the next bit that we're going to share with you, I'm just about to pass over to Alex, this question of the absence of Cyrene's voice will, will come up again and we'll keep coming back to it. But um, having looked at a number of different performance traditions, we started to think about what the equivalent performance tradition in our own culture might be for uh, narrative storytelling in, in in like an English folk culture. So I'm handing over to Alex to introduce the next piece. Right. So uh, we have the a ballad here, um, and uh, this is an interesting uh, form for lots of reasons. It is bardic. Um, we felt it resonated with with this text because of these reasons it, that it, it is a, a sort of bardic form. We're used to someone uh, a sort of authorial someone telling us a story very directly. Um, ballad form 
uh, quite often uses a structure, an AAB format, which is very recognisable from uh, from Pythian 9. Um, it's sort of low and high art, as much as it is accessible. Uh, we see these songs in, in places where people can hear them. Um, but there's a contract, which is that they're not background music, um, these songs in our culture. They tend to be songs that people, when they hear them, they also listen to them because they expect to be told a story. And that, that makes them not, not pop music, not folk music in a, in a funny way. Um, uh, this is a piece that we made. Uh, Helen wrote the words, I wrote some music, and then we uh, handed it to Leon with about three seconds uh, before the performance uh, began. Uh, we've obviously had a little bit of time uh, since then, so we've revised the song, um, all three of us, actually, the way we've, we've um, used this piece of material. And that in itself is really interesting. Um, it brings up something quite obvious, but, but the, the process of making even a simple song is, is a messy one. Um, and and not not straightforward, and it's not spontaneous or or instant, even if the poet tells you it's going to be. So what we have here is sort of version four um, of a of a ballad, and I guess the truism, the simple thing that that brings to mind is well, um, we think often it's really easy to think of these texts as they they are a snapshot um, uh, that these pieces can be living and they mutate depending on on the way they're performed. So here is a version of, of the piece that we collaborated on. Um, Leon, I hope you're ready and set up and you've got your, your sound bits um, ready because uh, you singing will, uh, will be lovely and say a lot more than I can right at this point. So Leon and his guitar. <laughs> Let me sing to you of Cyrene, the place and the girl, snatched by a god and taken to a land of widows. Let me sing to you of Apollo, who saw her, had to have her, no bridal race. He cut the chase to win her. Tell us, Socrates, we honor you with this story of your land. You ran your race, you snatched first place, a winner. One bright day, he found the girl play wrestling with a lion. The sweat, the sinew, speed, the strength within her. Apollo asked the centaur, can I have her, bet her, wet her, I'll tend her garden, pluck her fruit, I'll win her. Chiron laughed, good God, my God, why feign to ask permission? You know the future, who will be the winner? You know each blade of grass, each wave, the wind, the sea, the river, you see, you want, you take. You know you win her. Tell us, Socrates, we honor you with this story of your land. You ran your race, you snatched first place, our winner. But I'll tell the story if it gives you shivers of the future. You'll take her to a far off land of winners. And there you'll swathe her life in gold. Rich land, rich home, rich hearts. Now leave us king and let us sing our winner. Tell us, Socrates, we honor you with this story of your land. You ran your race, you snatched first place, our winner. You ran your race, you snatched first place, our winner.
some silent that, applause there. We should have unmuted everyone to applaud you. Thank you, Liam. <laughs> and thank you for doing that live over Zoom, which I'm aware must be a very strange thing to be doing at home at this precise moment in yeah. uh, London. Um, weird. <laughs> One of the things we've talked about is that Cyrene's voice isn't in there. And we did talk about whether to put her voice in and would that be a woman's voice singing? Would that still be the singer of the ballad the, um, ventriloquizing her voice? And I think that might be, uh, you know, version five or six of that might need to start to think about that question. Personally, I think we should be producing an entire concept album of uh, Pindar odes uh, in the style of English folk ballads. Uh, I think, I, you know, I, I think there's a mass market out there for that, but, um, but thank you uh, very much. Um, uh, Alex, anything before we keep going? Well, there were two things. I think there were, because Leon and I have discussed this piece this week, and coming back to it has been... Um, it's been really satisfying, actually, really interesting to revisit this work. And I agree, Helen, obviously, that watch out for the, the, the Pythian album that will be coming your way in 2029. Um, there's some, there are some unsatisfactory elements about that song, which I think is worth raising. Uh, Nancy raises the silence of Cyrene. It's worth saying that ballad tradition is one in which uh, women are uh, tend to be uh, involved in non-consensual uh, acts of violence or sex quite a lot. Um, that, that is, so this is very consistent with with our material, but I'm not saying that's acceptable. Um, we, Leon and I discussed the sort of tension between the refrain, uh, tell us Socrates, and the narrative which is going on, and Nancy's raised that. Uh, the dual calls on our focus, I think, are really tricky in a modern song form. Um, I don't have a solution, it's just an observation. And Leon, if you're there, you um, might articulate to me what you thought about interrupting Chiron's flow. Uh, yes, it might, my, my, yes, it's working. Um, I, it, just for me, in, in the sort of the performance of it, it's Chiron starts speaking and then you have a uh, chorus element and then sort of a musical sort of interlude in the structure that we currently have. And for me, it's, it's interesting um, as to whether it's apparent or it links neatly that the subsequent verse after this interlude is still Chiron speaking, or whether it's perhaps the bard who's now narrating again. Um, I don't. I, I'm, it's you know. I don't know if there's an answer or a or a solution, but it's um, it's just interesting to note if Chiron's speech tracks over that interlude, um, whether mm -hmm. those things should be brought together and then an interlude follows or precedes or whatever. But in terms of the song structure and strophic structure itself how that um yeah, yeah. How that um, ambiguity is is interesting mm. uh yeah. and, and problematic lana tells you it, it uh, on the on the chat that it yeah. that, uh, uh, yeah. that it works so it's yeah. very pindaric too to <laughs> right. have a, an ambiguous transition from a character to to a narrator yeah um, Nancy we, and I and Alex uh, talk quite a lot about about this idea of the, of the focus and how how we are still celebrating the victor when we're within the mythological narrative and and how how that works not just textually but performatively when you look at it on the page obviously you can easily work out where you are but in performance I think the two swim together so that you are continuously feeling the presence of both of those things um, as an audience member, both the both the the victor and and the mythological story. And we had a conversation about how um, with Nancy about how much they that they blend in experience in the way that we receive the text when you actually hear it performed, how much you are um, able to hold those two things sort of concurrently in in a way that isn't as, as well delineated as perhaps the text is. It's more uh, co-present. Um, the um, final thing we just wanted to share with you before we can um, uh, see if there's any questions about all this myriad of uh, um, uh, experiment, under-rehearsed experimentation, um, <laughs> is um, uh, we then came to this question of what a modern victory ode might be, because it's one of the problems with um, thinking about it in our culture is it doesn't really exist in our culture. So whereas we can look at ancient theater and look at contemporary theater and draw some lines and some parallels, if we're trying to do that, what are we talking about in our culture? Um, we had big discussions about the fact that we don't really have a victory of culture, which is because we feel quite, um, particularly in England, we live in a culture of self-deprecation where uh, having large numbers of people sing your victory might be seen to be terribly gauche. But, um, 
uh, but what we could uh, understand about uh, about the modern victory ode. So we um, invited another six poets, uh, having worked with six poets on, on performance translation, to have a go at the idea of a victory ode, um, a contemporary poem which celebrated not only an extraordinary person who had achieved something, but also their their place, their heritage, where they came from, um, and uh, did that by engaging with uh, mythology. It is quite an embryonic project. And in a minute, I'm gonna ask um, Leon and Maureen and Charlie to share with you, we've only got time to hear bits. So we're gonna hear the opening stanzas of four of the poems by four um, uh, exceptional um, poets from the UK um, and to whom we're enormously grateful. Um, it's worth saying that we are incredibly grateful to the Institute of Classic Studies in the UK who've just given us uh, a slither of funding to, to keep going on that particular trajectory of looking at what the modern victory ode might be. Um, and we'll be putting together a forthcoming publication of contemporary victory odes by contemporary poets, um, which uh, will be a, a poetry pamphlet. Um, and in doing so, I hope that in that process of collaboration, we'll also come to understand much more about what a victory ode really is, if we have to get to the bottom of helping contemporary writers to actually nail writing them. But I'm going to hand over now to um, three uh, brilliant performers to read excerpts from four extraordinary poets' work. Thank you. Uh, these are the openings of uh, four poems. <clears throat> to A.J. Pritchard on successfully evading capture by Richard O'Brien. Champion of Nantwich, many times I've thrilled to your stilted VTs frolics in a range of on-the-nose, song-themed locations, the humiliation of pretending to have seen a ghost in the rehearsal room, <clears throat> and watched you glide across the floor, chin clean, veneer smooth as a sexless angel, teeth aglow with wholesomeness, pine solid base on which the nervous steps of hopeful girls ascend to sequined dream. Ode to Olivia Coleman and her Golden Globe by Tessa Foley. Who grew this daisy? Hollywood, if it could. They expected a statue, a marble pussed effigy, one who with lethargy sucks up the applause and now pause. Here she comes, her boudican ride to this place before faces. She takes up her mace, waltzing past with a conscience pricking at the milieu. With a band's eye of blimey and impenetrable beams, so it seems this is Queen from the oldest of flats. For Lauren Zhang, 2018 winner of the BBC Young Musician Competition by Ruth Aylett. This metal, wood and ivory combined in a machinery of newly joyful freedom for a child, aged only four at first, Apollo smiled upon her birth, her touch so musical, so much of a promise made to our future day. When music pours out sweetly in this way, it's hard to hear the self-same keys thumped in our stumbling fur -ellies. Ode to Rahul Mandel, winner of the Great British Bake Off 2018 by Mark Cuban. Sweet is the moment when the baking's done the baker's hands crafting paradise lands. Where TV summer is golden year long. Timeless is the time when Howrah's young son conjures from flower the taste of the sun. Sweet is the moment when the baking's done. Thank you very much. So that's just a little glimpse uh, of some of the work that we've been doing on the idea of the modern victory ode. Um, if you want to find out more about any of those poets, or in fact that project, um, I'll pop something um, onto uh, Live Cannon's website uh, blog later tonight so that you can keep following um, our progress with that that work, but it's but it, I think it's going to be something really exciting and give us a chance to invest in really thinking about what, a, what components we need to, to make something a bona fide victory ode. Um, and I'm looking forward to all those dialogues with the poets and with, with Nancy. So um, 
we uh, we've shared a mad myriad of things <laughs> with you over the course of this, and I think it's hope it's given you some insights to some of the performance work that we've been doing um, to try and explore Pindar in this way. As I said at the beginning, it was going to be a little bit um, of a scattergun uh, approach, but I'm hoping that uh, many people might be inspired by this to think about other ways they could apply their performance practice to uh, Pindar. For example, we've barely touched the surface of dance uh, and Pindar, which would be an invitation to another research project. Um, I'd obviously like to thank the Archive for Performance of Greek and Roman Drama at Oxford for being um, so progressive, really, about uh, creating these week-long um, research projects which allow artists and academics to work together so freely and productively. Um, it's an extraordinary way to progress, I think, uh, research on performance uh, texts. So massive uh, shout outs to Fiona and everybody there for all their support. Um, and I'm going to hand over now to Alex and then to Nancy for their concluding thoughts before we answer some questions. Uh, thank you, Helen. Uh, concluding thoughts uh, are, are unorganised ones, but really that we we did touch only the surface of this of this subject, a, su a subject that most of us, uh, not including Nancy, knew almost nothing about before we uh, embarked upon it. Um, we left wanting to do and learn more. I'm really really grateful. Um, to the Festival of the Muses for giving us the excuse to come back to it because it has been exceedingly uh, stimulating and you can see from the range of responses that we've we showed you how much uh, really how much more there is uh, to do um, so I do hope that uh, there are people out there who are also interested in this material uh, and with whom we might uh, find a way of taking this uh, further so one one comment, I have a number of things that are on my mind. Um, one is about um, the uh, modern version, the modern victory odes. I'm very much listening to see if the paradox that I detect in Pindaric odes is present in any of these contributions. Um, the detail of the here and now of the victory, of the factual, of of the moment, how does that does that feed into a perpetuation into the far future of each of these odes? So I'm very interested in that. It, I'm, it, I'm, I've always been mystified by how Pindar does that, but that's been a lifetime fascination of mine. Then I was very interested in, um, I'm interested in semantic categories and why it is that the abduction of Cy the Cyrene seen as a victory, as was made really clear in Leon's performance of the ballad, that Telesicrates' victory and the admiration it earns from women spectators, which is explicit in the ode, is similar to Cyrene's being won by Apollo and Apollo performing a kind of victory over her. And I'm interested in the way the poem presents power and domination. We've talked a bit about and it's very, there's some important literature on colonization as a hierarchic domination of the helpless, of the those who are dominated. But now in this moment of history that we're in with Black Lives Matters and um, the day that we're, that Juneteenth celebrating the end of slavery, it comes to my mind that this kind of poem also can be a vehicle for understanding what silence enforced silence, uh, lack of request for consent, lack of wooing, lack of persuasion essentially could mean in another semantic domain, not just colonization, but slavery and um, uh, Jim Crow and um, voter suppression and other things like that seem to have that same structure perhaps, or it's, it's something that I've been thinking about in terms of Cyrene's silence. So it's not just a gender issue, but the looking at silence of the wooed maiden who is an exemplary athlete. And that's what earns her the admiration and the, uh, uh, the usurpation of her story is what I see happening in Pythian 9 in the myth. And I'm interested in seeing how that can be a vehicle for other meanings. Um, Thank you. 
That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Nancy. And I think there's a couple of uh, questions coming in. If anyone does want to ask a question, uh, there is a chat panel on the side of the YouTube live stream where you can type a question and then they're being relayed through to us here in Zoom. Um, so questions uh, just come in. Is it possible that athletic performance itself derives from choral performance? Um, uh, I'm going to ask Nancy if she has any thoughts on that before offering Oh, unmute. Okay. I bet Greg Nash has some thoughts about that. Um, it's, it seems as if the individual attainment of a victory, even though it's shared by his compatriots and, and the chorus of performers might be comprised of such compatriots of a, of a portion of them. So there might be an analog and, and a parallelism, but there is a sort of standing out of the one victor who wins a race. It's kind of a zero sum uh, event, less that, uh, more that than it is a collaborative event. But the victor's victory as an individual brings glory to his uh, polis when he returns home and when he gets an ode that will celebrate the whole constellation. But I don't know about the origins of it. Well, Greg's written about about the Olympic Games. I mean, we have we can always look at um, the games for Patroclus, the funeral games. There's a whole there's a whole literature on on the, on the connections between the rise of the Olympics and um, uh, the funeral games in Homeric epic. Uh, but I'm not able to say it's a choral performance off the bat by any means. You know, it's almost like I, I, it's almost like um, when an individual comes of age. I went to a um, a Native American ceremony once, and the 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 girl was coming of age, but it reflected on the whole community. So there was a kind of blessing going out to the whole community. It's more like that than it is a chorus performing together. And Nancy, does a chorus help to do that? The, the, if, if, if the performances were choral, does the fact that it was performed by um, uh, a chorus help to extend it from being a, an individual victory or an individual moment of prowess? The actual uh, embodiment of that in a choral performance presumably helps to suggest that there is a whole community that mm. is that is celebrating. Yeah, in an yeah. I mean, I think Leslie Kirk has written productively on the return of the victor into the community and the reintegration of the victor into the community. And yeah. that would be um, achieved by a choral performance. Yeah. Next question in is going to Alex. Can you speak to the consideration of instrumentation uh, in contemporary performance process? Do you use lyres or contemporary instruments? How do you make choices about um, instrumentation? I should say Alex has worked on lots and lots of different uh, settings of, of ancient music and uh, in contemporary performance, so he's definitely the best person to answer this question. <laughs> Thanks. It's a good question. Um, uh, there's a really boring answer to it, which is that um, the, the first considerations for what is going to play this music are uh, what have you got? What can you afford? And where are you playing? Uh, it's about the audience. It's about uh, that environment. Um, lyres are something I seldom work with, but that doesn't mean they're not the right thing uh, to interpret a text like this. Um, because it's an ancient Greek text that I feel very strongly that that doesn't mean uh, that it should be interpreted with a, a lyre, uh, with a kithara and, an, and, and a pipe. Um, I think... Um, it's about finding the right because if you're playing in a huge vast arena where we can't hear that uh then that'd be a waste of a lyre player um so the practical considerations and it's really boring to talk about practical considerations but when you're thinking about the mechanism of making a performance uh the, the practical aspects are the ones that, that really dominate and, and i think it's not unfair to say that they might have been really important to uh, to poets in the ancient world as they are in the uh, modern world. Um, so, I mean, you said lyres or contemporary instruments. There are choices there. There are choices, infinite choices, wonderful choices. Um, and many of them are made before I get in the room because of how how much or little uh, resource um, there is. Um, and the I think it's important to try and rule in uh, everything. 
uh, at the very first meeting, and by the second one, you've got a much uh, uh, a much smaller uh, range of choices. So that's a very woolly answer, but I hope it goes some way to Helen. Do, can you? Uh, would you like to come in on that? As a director in terms of directing those conversations yeah absolutely i mean i think i think at the beginning of this i sort of said we've never been particularly interested in reconstruction and i think that comes through in the work that we do in that we tend to um uh, try and create um something that works for a contemporary audience um uh, i um i think that's the way you honor brilliant writing uh from another period is to make it as brilliant for your audience and your culture um and so uh, a lot of our productions look quite contemporary and therefore the sound world of them matches the aesthetic world of them. And often um, for a composer who's writing music for live performance, they're to some extent have to be led by the aesthetics of that performance. So a director and designer might get in there first with what they what they want the production to look and feel and sound like. And the, and the music is an important part of creating that imaginative world. Um, and I think, um, there's an, some interesting um, sort of follow up um, uh, questions on this. A question to Alex. I, there are two more questions we've got time for, but I'm going to take the second one because uh, it links, which is a question for Alex. When composing music like this, do you approach it similarly to opera or musical where your librettist is centuries distant or is it much more like building from scratch? Can you see that question there as well, Alex? Yeah, I can. I, I think that's a great question. I really love that question. Um, it's one I've thought about and talked about before. Um, the key difference between working with a living, breathing uh, librettist like Helen, um, working with uh, a less living, less breathing uh, writer such as Pindar is that um, Pindar complains less when I change his words. Um, <laughs> and that sounds flippant, but it's really true. Um, and it, it, it's a dialogue. So you try and work, I try and write hand in glove with with another writer and it's a conversation and and it comes back to this business of of the the text on the page that we're working with being a, a snapshot it's only one moment and because we build things over time we write them over a period of a year or or 10 uh, in some cases and we rehearse them over a week or a month or two if we're really lucky and really really well resourced and and each song each bar is fluid because it, it starts as one thing it changes naturally and there has to be a conversation all the way there's a conversation between composer and librettist and director these things are always happening um and so those conversations are difficult different when i'm working with someone who's uh two and a half thousand who wrote two and a half thousand years ago i take different liberties although i go to different sources to find the sort of answers that i'd want from a living poet um i'm still i still try and be respectful although you'll note from my uh my work that i work a lot with dead people and maybe that's because i find them easier um the is it like building from scratch it's great i mean it, it's wonderful to have what i love about working particularly with classical texts is the amount of stuff they give you that quite often you don't find when you're working with a you don't i don't very often work with living writers who give me the metrical stuff uh, to build with, uh, which isn't to say that modern writers, contemporary writers cannot write rhythmically or interestingly. If you write in English, you are unlikely to write in uh, dactylo epitrite uh, verse forms. And that's a shame, frankly, that should be encouraged. I'm sure there's somebody at Harvard who's doing it right now. Um, but I so I it's it's not it's actually the opposite of working from scratch. Uh, what's great about that is that you've got even more stuff on the page to start with and you could find that constricting if you had a lot to say um most composers i think will tell you that that is really really helpful because if you've got a poet who's giving you stuff then uh you can build if they give you materials you can build if they give you nothing you can't so it's it's a joy in that way thank you alex um, and i'm going to come to the last question that we have time for um, and offer some thoughts and then perhaps ask Nancy to offer hers and, and wrap up. Uh, the question is concerning the performance history of Pindar's work since the 20th century, can you identify reasons as to why it hasn't received much attention? Um, I, I'm going to offer two thoughts on that. Um, one is um, uh, we haven't done much performing of Pindar's work in the 20th century because we don't have an obvious performance context for it in our culture, uh, whereas um, we take ancient plays and we put them on in our theatres, we have theatre in our culture, or um, uh, 
what we don't have is an obvious performance context for Pindar's work. So it hasn't obviously translated into, for example, uh, uh, concert music or some, uh, we don't have a, a victory ode context in our culture. So actually where Pindar's work might get performed uh, is an interesting question and one that we we started to unravel. But that's one of the reasons I think why we haven't had a performance tradition of it because we haven't yet worked out where and when that might take place. Um, also, because I think Pindar is slightly guarded as as a as a writer within within uh, an academic world as being something uh, difficult uh, and challenging. Often, uh, a lot of undergrads aren't exposed to it, um, and there's a sort of sense that I think I think we're slightly pushed away from it towards um, other lyric poets and towards um, and it's certainly not ever taught as a performance text in the way that perhaps things have changed and now. Drama is taught as performance text, I think, in most uh, in most educational settings now, um, uh, rather than being taught purely as as a text on the page. So I think we we haven't sort of invited that kind of discussion. But I think it's an absolutely brilliant question, and I think it's at the heart of this project. Is why hasn't the, I mean I when I said it flippantly to Nancy the first time I met her, has there been a you know, a performance practice investigation of, of Pindar, I sort of expected that there had and that that was the answer. And I was slightly surprised to find out how little had been done. Again, there has been some sort of work on reconstruction, but not a huge amount of creative work. So I'll just hand over to Nancy to perhaps answer that question and, and finish us off. Well, there's a, there is a considerable scholarship on what performance might be like so there's discussion of symposia as context for a possible reperformance. There's a, a big interest in reperformance and some literature on that. But without uh, live performance, I it's get it's very theoretical to me, and I prefer the pathway that we're embarking on or have embarked on. Um, I was one problem one challenge to me is that as a scholar I was always thinking of the whole poem as integrated and not separate inseparable but in our project especially in the challenges to six poets uh, to select certain parts of the ode and so on th there was a gravitation toward the myth of Cyrene and Apollo. There was one that dealt with the foot race at the end of the poem of the ancestor of Telesicrates. Um, I, I didn't see any any attempts to get the poet's story, which the composition narrative, which in some Pindaric poems is pretty pronounced. And I consider it to be a kind of um, structural unifying uh, element but I don't know if it performs well. It's sort of, I'd be curious that in the future, if we could try to find in um, uh, maybe Olympian one or another poem where there's prominence of the poet's activity and this notion of pseudo spontaneity where he pretends he can't quite make this poem, but we know of course that it's already made. That kind of dynamic I have argued on in print is very engaging to the audience because we care a lot about this poem working. So if the poet's stuck, we're it's suspense, we're in suspense for a while. So that kind of I'm interested in the in the uh, performability of that first person uh, narrative. It's it can be a narrative. I want to make this poem, I want to celebrate this victor. Oh my goodness, here's an obstacle I can't quite surmount. Oh, I surmounted it. Oh, now I finished my poem. It's a very simple narrative, but it brings the poet to a kind of victory over his material and over obstacles. And I think that that is dramatically interesting and could be a performative element. But there's lots to talk about in this, uh, in terms of reperformance, first performance, and that sort of thing. So shall I just say a massive thank you to all of you all over the place who've been listening and watching this and those of you who might listen to it uh, in, in the future. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to be able to, um, to have this conversation despite 
being unable for any of us to currently leave leave our houses. Um, uh, enormous, um, deeply felt thank you to Maureen, Charlie and Leon for their performance today and their performance on the film and their extraordinary contribution by being insanely talented and able to flip between performance styles, languages, ancient languages, singing, um, uh, and therefore make this kind of investigation possible, which is only possible with such brilliant uh, and uh, talented people in the room. Um, uh, and thank you very much to Lana and your team for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Helen. <laughs>